It's Friday, June the 13th, 2014. I'm Mark Chatterley, and this is episode number 38 of TEN, Transport Evolved News for the week beginning June the 9th, 2014. It's been hinted at for the past couple of weeks, but yesterday Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla Motors, confirmed that they will be releasing their patents to the world. The title of the statement, made in Tesla's usual way of a blog post on their site, made a geeky reference to the gaming phrase, or your base are belong to us. And it's the or there that's got people very excited. Speculation was that maybe Tesla was going to release some information about their supercharging technology, maybe the protocol it uses allowing other manufacturers to support it. But the or suggests that every single one of Tesla's patents, from the supercharging protocol, to the system itself, to the drivetrain information, to the heating and cooling systems, to the operating system that the car uses, quite frankly this is huge. This doesn't just mean that anyone can do anything they want with Tesla's information. Open source means that anyone can see the pattern and how to implement it, but Tesla is still able to impose conditions on use. Say, a manufacturer can only use supercharger technology if their car has at least 150 miles of range and active cooling. That's just an example, but what's going to happen now is anybody's guess. But I think we're going to hope for the best outcome. It's taken a long, long time to get here, but last weekend to the keys to the first five UK Model S's were handed over to their owners by Elon Musk himself. These five cars mark the start of the UK rollout and we expect to see many orders fulfilled over the coming weeks as the backlog is cleared. The handover was held at the London Supercharger location in Royal Victoria Docks. One of the first owners of the Model S is E.L. James. You may be thinking you know that name from somewhere. Well, I'll give you some clues. They're a novelist. They started off writing fan fiction for a popular novel series. Their book went straight to the top of the bestsellers list. And their book was known for being a little bit saucy. Get it? They're the author of Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah, I know. All I can say is I hope they're enjoying the Model S as much as people have enjoyed their novels. Maybe not quite that much. The ongoing Tesla mystery of where it's going to build its Gigafactory took an unexpected turn this week when it emerged that California is doing its best to tempt Tesla into building this in their state. Originally, California was not on the list of possible locations due to the fact that Tesla needs this factory up and running as fast as possible. The regulations and red tape in place in California, basically to ensure that new factories are energy efficient and not too polluting, means that Tesla would never be able to jump through all the hoops in time. But now it appears that Tesla might be able to build the Gigafactory in California thanks to a bipartisan bill rapidly making its way through state Senate. Senate Bill SB 1309, introduced earlier this year to the Senate as one which required urgent attention, sought to enact legislation to expedite groundbreaking and construction in California of large-scale battery factory to manufacture batteries for both electric vehicle and stationary use. Read for the second time on Wednesday last week, SB 1309 has been re-referred to the Senate Committee on Rules and is expected to pass very soon. So soon, in fact, that the possible Gigafactory sites may soon be Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Nevada and California. Talking with Automotive News this week, BMW executive Ian Robertson, who fronts BMW's brand sales and marketing and group retail operations, said that an overwhelming majority of BMW i3 customers are new to the brand, with around 80% of i3 customers buying a BMW for the first time. This mirrors sales figures from rival automakers like Nissan and Chevrolet, who report a similar conquest effect from electric vehicle sales. But perhaps more interesting is the fact that many i3 customers are first-time car buyers. With European i3 sales now totaling more than 3,000 cars since BMW officially launched the car last November, Robertson says i3 production at BMW's German factory is now around 100 cars a day. i8 adapters seem to be buying the car in line with other premium cars in the range, with some, what I guess are very wealthy customers, buying more than one car, one for each of their houses, you see. Well, if you have the money, why not? This week, Volkswagen delivered the first XL1 to its new driver, Dr. Christian Maloney, who picked up the car with his family from Volkswagen's transparent factory in Dresden. He was handed the keys to his new car by Thomas Zahn, Director of Sales and Marketing of German Volkswagen Passenger Cars. We've talked a few times about this vehicle. It's Volkswagen limited production, hyper-efficient plug-in diesel hybrid. With its sleek design, upward swinging doors and cameras for wing mirrors, the car certainly cuts an impressive silhouette. In fact, it wouldn't look out of place on a science fiction movie set. Volkswagen are making just 250 of these cars, and at over 100,000 euro a pop, these cars aren't going to be commonplace. 
The XL1 has some impressive stats when it comes to efficiency. It boasts an average fuel consumption of 0.9 litres per 100 kilometres and has a drag coefficient of just 0.189. This allows the car to travel for more than one kilometre while using 0.1 kilowatt hour of power from its battery pack, giving it a claimed electric only range of up to 50 kilometres. Nikki got a ride in one of these last year. Why not check out her thoughts on the car on our website? I'll put the link in the description below. Porsche is entering this year's Le Mans race with their 909 Hybrid, their self-titled most complex Porsche race car ever created. But what makes this car special? Their new hybrid drivetrain that recovers energy lost in exhaust gases and uses it to make the car more efficient. Now I know this isn't a plug-in hybrid so it's a little outside our normal scope, but stay with me. The technology on display here is actually quite clever, even if it is lacking a plug. Basically, the car uses an extra turbine generator unit instead of what's called a waste gate. This valve normally allows excess energy from the exhaust gases that are not required to drive a compressor to escape into the atmosphere. Porsche uses this excess energy from the exhaust gases to drive a second turbine, which in turn drives a generator that produces electrical energy. This makes the Porsche 909 Hybrid the only car on the racetrack, and anywhere else I know of, that recuperates energy not only when it brakes, but also when it accelerates. I wish Porsche all the luck at Le Mans. Following on from last month's official recall of a total of 270 US-made Nissan Leafs to check for missing structural welds, the Japanese automaker has recalled an even smaller number of US-made Leafs for power inverter replacement. All built during a 10-day period in April this year, the cars are being recalled to check for an out-of-specification circuit board inside the car's high-power inverter. Nissan isn't the only manufacturer to have issues with the inverter in their electric cars. Last month, Fiat Chrysler recalled 4,100 141 Fiat 500e electric cars to fix a potential leak in the car's coolant system, which could result in an internal short circuit in the car's power inverter module. Messan says the fault is with the circuit board in 196 recalled Leafs could result in a sudden loss of power to the Leafs 80 kilowatt electric motor, although it isn't aware of any instances where this has actually happened. If it affects your car, you have heard from Nissan already or be hearing from them in the very near future. Do you ever just set your cruise control and relax with a good audio book on a journey? Or maybe a good album? It's a great way to drive, far more relaxing than slipping in and out of lanes and weaving around cars to try and get just that little bit ahead. But it's not so good for range. Those sections where instinctively a driver would allow a car to slow down or gain speed, conserving energy, just don't happen as the car tries to maintain a set speed. Using cruise control can cost you range, but maybe not for too much longer. Professor Hermann Koch-Gruber and graduate student Hugh Wang from the University of Heilbronn think they've managed to model the driving techniques of hypermilers in such a way that a cruise control system could use it to save fuel. Koch-Gruber says he started with research by learning manual hypermiling techniques, applying what he knew of behind the wheel to a 2012 Ford Focus with manual transmission. Koch-Gruber says he expects to have a prototype system in place by March next year to see if the system would work in the real world. But he hints other people in the automotive industry, including his former employer Bosch, are already working on similar technologies. And I'm sorry if I pronounced any of those names wrong. At the international launch event for the Nissan ENV200 electric van this week, a vehicle which shares the same drivetrain found in the Nissan LEAF, Nikki noticed something rather interesting which makes us think Nissan might be rethinking its policy on battery heating and cooling. The ENV200 has a small air conditioner built into its battery pack, Despite using the same capacity battery pack and identical battery cells to the LEAF, the ENV200's battery pack is more tightly packed together under the floor than it is in the LEAF. As with the LEAF, cells are stacked one on top of another in an underfloor sealed battery box. But at the front of the battery compartment, just ahead of the first row of cells, is a small radiator and large electric fan. And entering the battery pack from the front is a coolant feed from the van's air conditioning system. Nissan wouldn't go into too many details, but it looks as if the ENV200 can send warm or cold coolant from the van's main HVAC system into a small integral radiator within the battery box. Air is then drawn over the radiator from outside and is then cooled or heated as needed to keep the battery pack and battery box at the optimum temperature. No one we spoke to at Nissan would confirm or deny the possibility that Nissan is considering active battery cooling or heating for future electric vehicles, nor could we get any indication of the feature making its way into the next generation leaf. But by using this more compressed battery layout with temperature management, it would leave some space in the leaf for, say, 
extra batteries or somewhere to store junk food. Both are very important to me. That's it for this week. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode of TEN. In the meantime, visit www.transportevolved.com for all the EV news that's fit to print, subscribe to our channel and other shows on YouTube, and join us for our talk show where we'll be discussing these stories and others on Transport Evolved. I'm Mark Chatterley, and until next time, stay tuned.